Good morning, everybody. So good to see all of you. Good to see all of you that are online. Uh, well, I don't really see you, but I perceive that you are there. And uh, it's good to see everybody here. Uh, are, you, are you feeling good today? I'm feeling good today. After that worship, my gosh, are we not blessed with the best worship team members? I mean, just awesome. Awesome talent and amazing hearts, and um, just love them. If you got to work with them every week like I do, you would, you would, you would know what I'm talking about. They're just awesome people. Um, we're continuing our What the World Needs Now series. And what does the world need now? Love. What kind of love? Sweet love. There we go. Sweet love. Um, I wanted to let you know that we are still doing our 10-minute Q&A uh, right after the service for anybody who wants to know more about the church. Maybe you don't want to stay for lunch. Maybe you're afraid of some of us, and you don't want to stay for lunch. This is a great way, uh, if it's your first time, to get to know uh, me, uh, to get to know Lene, to get to know a little bit about what our church is about. And if you really want to dig in, uh, whether you've been here a short time or a long time, uh, you can plug in to our Compass session, and this is session three today, but it doesn't matter if you haven't gone to one or two, you can come to any session, they are, they are standalone sessions, and you can start any time. How many of you have been to the Compass sessions already, in any session, okay? All right, was it good? Was it awesome? How was the food? Tell me, how was the food? The food was great. And, and how, how was I? Did I talk too long? Okay. And the best part is that you get to hear from Ray and you get to hear, and today it's, it's mainly Lene. So you get to hear from Ray. You get to hear from Lene. You get to hear from Rebecca, who was singing up here today. Uh, she is a part of this session. And you get to hear a little bit from me today, but not much, not much. I know you're tired. By the time you get through with this worship service, you're, you've heard enough of me, right? Um, so this week was Valentine's Day week, right? Monday was Valentine's Day. And I told Lene, like I told you last week, I said, let's watch a movie. And I said, what movie would you like to watch? And she said, I, I've been wanting to watch this movie, and it, and it had to be just God working all this out. But she said, I'll, I want to watch this movie called Redeeming Love about the story of Hosea and Gomer. Golly. <laughs> I had to say, I'm sorry. Big Andy Griffith fan. But uh, her mama didn't like her too much, I, uh, I guess. But uh, she named her Gomer. So... Uh, she said, I want to watch this movie, and it's set in the 1800s, and I'll just have, I'll tell you, uh, it's a beautiful story. I mean, a beautiful story of redemption, but it has some really hard scenes in it. So if you don't like violence and you can't take that kind of thing, you might not want to watch that movie. But we watched it uh, one night this week, I forget which night, and it was such a great movie, and it was such a beautiful story of... What love can be mm. and what real love is. And I began to get excited about the story today. And there's, it's a different kind of story. It's a different kind of story. It's a story that's woven within prophecy, as you'll see as we get into the scripture. And it, it talks about the love that God has for us, and it's so awesome. It's so amazing. And, and what I want you to do is I want you to open up your heart. I want you to open up your heart. I want you to open your emotions to this story. Guys, I know that's a very hard thing for you to do. But I want you to do it. I want you to open your mind. I want you to open your heart to this story. And the, the title for the message today is Love Never Quits. 
Somebody's got to fill in for Donna today, okay? I'm not feeling the energy. So, uh, okay, all right. I'm counting on you guys, you Christians over here. I'm, I'm counting on you. G- give me a little feedback, okay? Love never quits. Woo! Love never quits. It never quits. You might have thought that love quits, but love never quits. Not God's love. God's love never quits. Um, gosh, there's just so, you know, my problem today, and don't get nervous, but my problem today is that there's so much that I want to say, but I, I just don't know what to leave in and what to leave out. But I will say this. That when I used to go to the jail and do jail ministry, and we had this altar call, and which was just come and kneel on the concrete next to the bars, you know. And when I would do this altar call, and I told you last week, everybody came, every single inmate that I, that I preached to for two years, they all came the first time to the altar call. It was an amazing miracle of God's mercy and His his grace and just, I don't even know how to describe it, but, but these guys would come and they would, they would kneel at the bars and they would receive Christ. And even if they had already received Christ, they would still come and, and, and to the bars and they would kneel down and some of them were crying. And you'd see these guys, they're tattooed up, they're big, they're, they're scary looking, you know, and they're coming to receive Jesus and they're putting their hand on the back of their brother, you know, who's coming for the first time and they're praying for him. And, and it's just such a beautiful thing. But I would tell them before they would come down, I would say, don't come to this altar call. Now, that's not a good way really to start an altar call, right? It's just say, don't come. But I would say, don't come before you count the cost because once you give yourself to Jesus, it's different. Isn't it different? It's not the same as it used to be. You're different. You don't belong to yourself anymore. And I would tell them that. And I would tell them, you give your life to Jesus here and you go back out on the street, God will begin to discipline you because the scripture says he disciplines those he loves. It's true. It's true. And man, does God love me. He loves me. Woo! He loves me. Um, and, and this is a scripture that demonstrates this. And I, I just want to share it with you. It's from uh, 1 Corinthians. It says, and it's talking about sexual immorality, by the way, which is very relevant for the story. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You do not belong to yourself anymore. And this is the kicker. You were bought with a price. Oh, my goodness. What happened? I was bought with a price. Man, you weren't just paid for. You were paid for. You were redeemed. He paid for you with the breaking of his body and the shedding of his blood and the torture of of the flogging and the torture and humiliation and the shame of the cross. He paid that price for you. And once you give yourself to him, there's no going back. There's no going back. And he will pursue you relentlessly with a love that does not quit and a love that does not fail. You can count on it. Can you count on it, Linda? You can count on it, can't you? You can count on it. Yeah. You can. I love it. I love it. You can count on the fact that he will never let you go. And you were bought with a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. And so we're talking about the story of Hosea and Gomer. Hosea and Gomer. Let's get into... Um, let's get into the story. Hey, uh, where is Ryan? Ryan, 
Uh, can you move it that way just a little bit? Um, Hosea and Gomer. So let's get into this. Hosea 1, when the Lord began to speak through Hosea, prophet Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her, for like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. Let me tell you what was going on here. Uh, uh, the, the, the Israel, you know, if you read the Old Testament, you know this, but Israel, they were constantly uh, walking away from God and then coming back to Him. Walking away and coming back. Walking away and coming back. Does that sound like anybody to you? It's humans, right? That's who we are. That's the kind of people we are. We're fickle. We can't make up our minds. We think we can go our own way. We think we've got it covered. We think we can take care of ourselves. And then we find out in a moment, whenever we get that pain, and we go to the doctor, and he says, there's something wrong with you. Then, Jesus, we're right back there, you know. Whenever you lose your job, Lord, help. Whenever some calamity ha happens in your life, you, you find out that you can't live without him. And so what he's saying is that, that, that the children, he says, go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her because like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness. His children, Israel, they were being unfaithful to him. And what was going on was unprecedented prosperity. There were great vineyards for miles. I mean, there was, there was silver. There was gold to be had. Uh, everybody was living a lavish lifestyle. Does that sound familiar to you? By, the, by biblical standards, the lives that we live are lavish lives. We have a warm house, most of us. We have a warm house. We have a bed, a warm bed to sleep in at night. We have entertainment. We have communication with our phones and our computers. We have food to eat. We have roofs over our head. What we have, what, what we have is a palace. We, most of us live, by biblical standards, we live in palaces. That's the way it is today in this, in this world that we live in. So he told Hosea, he said, as a sign to my people, he said, I want you to go and marry a promiscuous woman and I want you to have children with her. So he married Gomer, daughter of Diblium, and she conceived and bore him a son. Then the Lord said to Hosea, call him Jezreel because I will soon punish the house of Jehu for the massacre at Jezreel the valley of Jezreel, and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel. If you want to read the story about Jezreel, the massacre at Jezreel, go to 2 Kings 9. Uh, what's going on here is that God said to one of his prophets, I want you to take a message to Jehu, and I want you to anoint him king, and, and then I want you to quickly leave. But, but when the prophet, the servant prophet, went to who was charged to go tell Jehu this, when, whenever he went, he did not leave quickly. He added on to the prophecy, I want you to slaughter the king. And so he ended up killing two kings, a visiting king and the king uh, that was there in, in this valley called Jezreel. And, and God says, I am going to, I'm going to put an end to the kingdom and I will put an end to the kingdom of Israel, and it's going to happen at this valley of Jezreel. It's a great story. You can go read that. In that day, I will break Israel's bow in the valley of Jezreel. And if you read the story, you, re you realize why that valley is, is important. So, Gomer conceived again. Now, the first child was Jezreel. This was Hosea's son. All right, second child was a daughter 
And then the Lord said to Hosea, call her Lo Ruhamah, which means not loved. For I will no longer show love to Israel that I show that I should, let's see, no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Now, we're going to see in the prophecy in just a minute, this was a child that, was, that came out of an adulterous affair between Gomer and someone else, some other man. This is, I, I can't describe, uh, I've never had this happen to me, but I can't describe to you the, the heartache unless you have gone through it or seen somebody go through it. I had someone come uh, to see me years ago, and they came to tell me a similar, similar situation that, that, their sp- that his wife had had a child, and, and he had raised this child as his own, and in an argument, she said that that child was not his. And he went and got a paternity test and found out that indeed that was not his child. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the heartbreak? Can you imagine the the inconsolable grief that that would bring to think that this is your child and it's not your child? And then to have, in in this man's case, have the child taken away from him. He was inconsolable. He was broken down like you would not believe. And I saw that grief, and I can't imagine that if somebody were to come to me and tell me that one of my sons is not really mine, I don't, I don't know if I could handle that. But this is exactly what was going on in Hosea's life. So she had this second child. It was a daughter, and and she was called Lo Ruhamah, which means uh, not loved. And, and he says, and this is part of the prophecy. For I will no longer show love to Israel that I should at all forgive them. Now, one thing I should say is that this is, this is poetry. This is artistic. This is, um, this is a way of depicting God's love for his people and their rebellion toward, toward God. And, and so I just want you to know that God is not this wishy-washy. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to love them, and then I'm not going to love them. I'm going to help them. I'm not going to help them. I'm going to save them. I'm going to, to destroy them. Uh, he, that's not, God is not like us. He is not human. Although a human wrote this, he is not a human. And he doesn't think like this. He knew that he would have to come to this earth and give his self, himself, his life, a ransom for us before he ever even created Adam. This, none of this came as a surprise to him. I could give you scriptures about it, but none of this came as a surprise to God. God knew at what was going to be the end at the beginning. And so this was... What God was saying, he was saying, name that child Lo Ruhamah. She was conceived outside of your marriage. After she had weaned Lo Ruhamah, Gomer had another son, also an adulterous affair, the result of an adulterous affair. Then the Lord said, call him Lo Ami, which means not my people, for you are not my people and I am not your God. It's not because God chose not to be their God and God chose for them not to be his people. It's because they have rebelled against him and they have walked away from him. Do you see what's going on here? And so then we go into the next chapter, which is prophecy. And he starts talking about this. And he says, I will not show my love to her children because they are children of adultery. Their mother has been unfaithful and has conceived them in disgrace. It's disgraceful that God's people had walked away from me. And then what we see in chapter 3 is he's talking to Hosea, Hosea again. And he's saying, go and show your love to your wife again. Though she is loved by another man and is an adulteress. 
If you watch this movie that, that I was telling you about, Redeeming Love, if you watch that, you'll see this unfailing love. What does 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says? Love never fails. Never fails. This undying, unfailing love. And so he says to Hosea, go and find your wife. Your wife, by this time she's gone. He probably doesn't even know where she is. And so God is telling, telling him, go find her. Go find her and go show your love to your wife again. Though she has been unfaithful to you, though she is with another man or has been with another man, and even though she is an adulteress, go and show your love to her again. Love her as the Lord loves the Israelites, though they turn to other gods and love the sacred raisin cakes. Come on. Does that strike anybody else as funny? The sacred raisin cakes. I read about the raisin cake. I, okay. I read the Old Testament and I'm, I'm constantly reading about raisin cakes. What is this? Raisin cakes. So I looked it up this week because raisin cakes are good. Raisin cakes. When, when somebody is down and out and they've been sick or they've been hurt or they, and they haven't eaten in a long time... What do, you, what do you break out to, to revive them? It's like an IV, okay? It's raisin cakes. That's, 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 what, that's what you give somebody because it's nourishing. And so what a raisin cake is, is it's, it's dried fruit that's been pressed together into a cake. Mmm. Sounds good, doesn't it? No. Uh, not to me, it doesn't. Um, but... Evidently, this was, this was the thing. And it was a luxury. It was a luxury. It was expensive. It was, it was lavish. And it was also a part of these pagan god rituals that the Israelites were participating in. Okay? So they, uh, what he was saying is that the Israelites love the sacred raisin cakes. They, they love... They love this lavish lifestyle. They love the money. They love the houses. They love the food. They love the jewels. They love the prosperity. They love even the sacred raisin cakes that are used in pagan worship. These gods, these, the worship of these gods, these little g gods. So he goes and he finds her and it says, So I bought her for 15 shekels of silver, that's six ounces, and about a homer and a lethic of barley. For you um, engineers, that's 430 pounds because that's what engineers do. Like, they like to be exact and they like to know what, what a homer is and a, le- a lethic and 15 shekels. But that's what it is. And so he bought her and... He told her, he said, you are to live with me many days and you must not be a prostitute or be intimate with any other man and I will behave the same way toward you. And then we have this other thing that happens. Now, it happens later in um, second, I'm sorry, the second week I had to do this, but um, but, I'm sorry, I lost my thought, my train of thought. So he says, you will, you will, I don't want you to be with any other man, and I don't, and I will live the same way. And then, as you go through all the prophecies, through all these chapters, you see this pattern, you see what God is saying to Israel, and he, he's saying, you know, These are the consequences for walking away from me, for not being my children, for not uh, obeying me, for not following me. These are the consequences, and this is what you're. This is what you're doing. But come back to me. And there's this place in um, in Hosea chapter eleven where he says, "How can I give you up, Ephraim?" How, 
How can I give you up? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I do it? Do you hear, do you hear the agony in his voice? God is God, but make no mistake, God feels things. He feels his love for us. Love. Love is the most blessed thing in the universe. But when you commit to it and you really love, you can count on the fact that at some point there's probably going to be some pain. It's probably going to be some pain. It may not be that this person walks away from you or betrays you or abandons you. It may not be that, but there's going to be some pain. When Houston played football a few years ago, he, uh, he's a good kid, let me tell you. He's a good, good kid. And he played football and he gave it his best. And the... Uh, I have to be careful about this because it makes me so angry. But the uh, football coach, the part-time, whatever, football coach uh, that was practicing him that day thought that it, was, it would be good to toughen him up a little bit. And so he puts Houston, who's this size, up against a grown man. You know, this is a guy, a guy who's, uh, you know, 6'1 and 200 pounds. And, and he goes and he, he, caught, he, he, he sends them in some kind of drill where they're hitting each other time after time after time until Houston, his, his concussion is so bad and he's so out of it, he, he doesn't really even know what's going on. And this person was doing that to my son. That's painful because I love my son. Sometimes, even with the best of people, you're going to go through some pain. That's what the investment is about, and that's what real love is about. And this is what God is saying. Do you feel the pain? Do you feel the pain? How can I give you up, Ephraim? How can I hand you over, Israel? How can I treat you like Adma? Who is Adma? I don't know who Adma is. I didn't look it up. I'm sorry. How can I make you like Zeboyim? Anybody? My heart is changed within me. All my compassion is aroused. Do you know the feeling? All of my compassion is aroused. Ever been mad at a family member and they come to you with tears in their eyes and they say, I'm sorry? Do you know the, the feeling that is aroused, the compassion that is aroused when that happens? It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And God is saying, I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Return, Israel, to the Lord your God. Your sins have been your downfall. Take words with you and return to the Lord. Say to him, forgive all of our sins. Do you see how, he, how willing he is to forgive even the worst sins? You see how, how willing he is to forgive even the worst rebellion on our part? He says, Come to me and say, forgive all our sins and receive us graciously that we may offer the fruit of our lips. Praise to you. Come, come back to me, Israel, because love never quits. The Apostle John said something about God that we wouldn't know if he hadn't said it. We wouldn't know it for a fact unless he'd said it. He said that God is love, and God never quits. God is love, and God never quits. You can count on this, that when you give your life to Jesus, as soon as you turn in his direction, he is there. As soon as you call his name, he is there. As soon as you say, oh my gosh, I have been wrong and I'm coming back to God, he is there because God never quits. You think about it. How can love stop being love? 
How can love stop being love? Love, love can't stop being love because God can't stop being God. You think God ever takes a break? I just don't want to be God today. I'm going to find somebody like Jim Carrey and I'm just going to take the day off. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Bruce Almighty. Isn't it Bruce Almighty? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you're, you're it. Yeah. That's old school. John Denver. That's old school. Okay. So love can't stop being love because God can't stop being God. Love, love never quits. Love never quits. When I was in my early 20s, 24, mid-20s, 24, I got married. I was too young to get married. Now, I'm not saying 24 is too young to be married. I'm just saying that me at 24, I was too young to get married. But I got married, and on Valentine's Day, one year after we were married, on Valentine's Day, she packed up her bags, and she left me on Valentine's Day. She was a real sweetheart, let me tell you. Man, I got to be careful. I got to be careful. I, because, you know, I start being myself up here, and you're expecting me to be a pastor. Um, but that was real nice. Come home from work on Valentine's Day, expecting you're going to have a nice dinner waiting on you. You see a bunch of boxes and things packed at the door. Woo, woo, woo. Um, and listen, I, I, was, I was a devout Christian. I, I loved God. I never wanted to be divorced. I didn't believe in divorce. I didn't want it. And I tried my best to hang on to her, but she was not having it. And she had had an adulterous affair. I didn't know it at the time, but she had had an affair. And, and so I was, I was, man, I was broken to pieces for about a month after that happened. She, she, uh, I tried everything. I went to, went to counseling and I tried to get her to go to counseling. We did all this stuff, trying to hold this marriage together. But she was, she was intent on leaving and she, there, was no, there was no reconciliation. Not, it just wasn't going to happen. And she had the divorce papers drawn up and she was calling me every day, come sign these papers, come sign these papers. I can't stand you. I don't ever want to be married to you again. And finally, I went and I signed the papers. And every day that I look at my wife and I look at my children and I look at my life, I thank God that in his mercy, that in his mercy, it was not my decision. In his mercy, he allowed me to, to, to get past that terrible decision that I made. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Can I get an amen? amen. Love never quits. I found this out. Every morning, I would get up, and, and once once. I got moved out of Nashville, and once I came, uh, once I went down to Montgomery, and I got into my new apartment, and got a job, and all that stuff, and, I, and it was a rough year now, because I had to get material, you know, the material part of my life, I had to get that back together again, but after um, a month or two, I realized that God had spared me, I, I realized that God, that I needed to thank God, and I needed to to appreciate him. And so I made this vow to God and I said, I will not even date another girl until 12 months have passed. I'm going to give you a year of my life, Lord. I'm not going to even attempt and I'm not going to accept a date. And, and I had this really cute girl that asked me out during that time and I started to rethink my plan, but just being honest. And, uh, but I said, no, not going to do it. I'm, I'm giving this year to God. And this is what I did every morning. I got up every morning and I quoted this scripture. And I'm going to quote it to you like I quoted it to God. And I'm going to quote it to you like I quoted it to the enemy. Because I knew that God and the enemy were both listening. And this is how I quoted this scripture every morning out of Romans. 
Because the enemy was telling me, God don't like you no more because of what you did. You are a failure. You're never going to be what you ever wanted to be, which is all I ever wanted to be was in full-time ministry. You're never going to be able to do that. You're disqualified. And I would quote this every morning, who shall separate me from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? What's the answer? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Come on, y'all. This is, the, this is your part here. Come on. We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am convinced. The old King James says, for I am persuaded. I am persuaded that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither thing, nor I have to put this in, but neither the things that are present nor the things in the future nor any powers, neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation. He's covering it all, right? And anything else in all creation will be able to separate me from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Come on. That's for you too. This is for you too. I found that when I quoted this every morning, I found that the love of God never quits and I was ready for my day. I was, man, I was loaded too. I, would, I, would, I was loaded for whatever the enemy sent my way. And, and it was a beautiful, beautiful thing that happened. It's, it's a long story, and I'm not going to go into all of it. But I'm telling you, God loves us so much. And who can separate us from the love of God? Nobody. Well, what if you've never been? What if you've never been a Christian? What, what if you've never made a commitment to him? Where is he? He is wherever you are. It doesn't matter where you are. The Old Testament says, though you make your bed in, anybody know? Hell. Though you make your bed in hell, I am there. All you who are watching online, Somebody who just stumbled across this. Maddie. Maddie's not in here, but Maddie will do that video edit this week and she'll hear this. Put this part in there, Maddie. <laughs> Though, for, for those who might, might be scrolling through online, and you, you see this, I want you to know that though you make your bed in hell, God says, I am there. No matter where you are, God is there. And he is as close as the mention of his name. What is his name? Jesus. And his name shall be called Jesus. He is there for you. You can change everything right now. And I want to share with you a scripture uh, it's actually a song that came right out of this scripture, almost word for word, out of Psalm 91 that my friend Tom wrote. And I want to share these lyrics with you that have, he wrote this about the time I was going through this, and I listened to this song until I wore out the cassette tape. It wouldn't even play anymore. And the lyrics are right out of Psalm 91 He will cover you with his feathers. And under his wings, you will find refuge. And his faithfulness will be your shield. And you will never have to fear the night. He will cover you with his wings. Jesus, he looked over Jerusalem. And he said, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem. 
how many times I would have gathered you under my wings. This is Jesus talking now. As he's looking over the city of Jerusalem, he's saying this. He said, he said, Jerusalem, oh Jerusalem, how many times I would have gathered you under my wings as a hen gathers her chicks, but you would not. He aches for us. He pines for us. He thinks about us all the time. C.S. Lewis says, we have, an inf- we have a God who dwells in infinity. And if you think that he doesn't have time to think about you, he's got all the time that you require to think about you. And he thinks about you day and night. He's always, always thinking about you. So what are we going to do about that? How about we follow him? How about we do that? How about we start saying yes to God? He's thinking about you all the time. He he cannot stop thinking about you. I think there's a scripture. I I may be wrong about this. Y'all can look it up, Google it. He said, my thoughts are like the sands. My thoughts toward you are like the sands or as numerous as the sands of the sea. That's a lot of thoughts. It's a lot of thoughts. You think you're thinking about you a lot. <laughs> you probably are because we all do, right? We all spend so much time thinking about ourselves, right? God thinks about you more than you think about yourself. And he just he wants you so bad. I'm going to leave you with this. We're, we're doing a new series, planning team. Y'all don't know about this yet, but... We're doing a new series. It's coming up uh, in March. And it's called Flipping the Church. It all came to me this week. Flipping the Church. Because I've been talking about this in our Compass sessions. Um, What we want to do here is we want to flip the church. In most churches, you think about all the churches that you've been involved in over the years. I think about all the ones that I've been involved with. You think about it. Uh, And Ray, man, love Ray Alistair. Ray, he's like, we were at lunch the other day and he was amening me on this. He was, oh, oh, who knows Ray? Oh, rah, oh, amen. In most churches, it's a handful of disciples running the church, and the rest are churchgoers. They're not very heavily invested. And so what we want to do is we want to flip the church. And if I didn't think we could do this, I wouldn't say it out here in front of everybody. I wouldn't say it if I didn't think we could do this. But Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples. He didn't say, I realized this week, he didn't say make apostles. I can't make an apostle because I can't fill you with the Holy Spirit. But he said make disciples. You know what a disciple is? Somebody that follows Jesus. And and so what I want to do here and what God wants to do here at this church is he wants to make disciples. In other words, he wants to flip it. He wants to flip it. He wants to flip it so that most all of us The vast majority of us are disciples, and they're only a handful. Like, you would have trouble finding somebody that's just an attender, somebody that's not plugged in, somebody that's not a disciple. You would have trouble finding that person once we flip the church. And and I'm going to talk about flipping the church. I'm going to talk about flipping your mind. I'm going to talk about flipping your heart. I'm going to talk about flipping your soul. Man, I'm, I'm really excited about this. I don't sense that you are as excited as I am, but I am excited about this. And, and so this is what I'm leaving you with today. God is calling us all to dig deeper. 
He is calling us all to follow closer. He's calling us all to just say yes to him. Are you with me? All right. I, I think I heard everybody that time say amen. That's awesome.